thirty. So if uh, board members could turn their cameras on, please. I think we're all here. Uh, Chair Weigel, we're having some technical mm -hmm. difficulties. Do you mind holding for a minute? Uh, we're waiting. Oh, for, sure. Yeah. We're waiting for Amy Nicholson to get on. Okay. Sure. Yeah. No big deal. Um, five, ten minutes. What do you guys want? Uh, let's do five. Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. No big deal. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Staff Liaison Nicholson, would you please test your audio and visual for us? Hi, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. Thank you so much. For members of the applicant team, we will be allowing you permission to speak when the item comes up. Thank you so much.
Hi all, um, recording secretary Buckheit here. Before we get started, I just wanna let you know that we do have interpretation services joining us this evening. Um, so there's something I'd like um, to say before we get started, if that's okay with you, Chair Weigel. Um, uh, how are we doing on the technical stuff? Are we all solved? Uh, yes, we're okay. Um, can you hear me? I can indeed. Um, before you call the meeting to order, I just wanted to let you know that we do have interpretation services joining us. Um, and I just wanna say a little blurb for um, members of the public so they understand um, how to navigate themselves. Okay, sure. Um, maybe we'll do that uh, after approval of minutes. Does that sound like a good plan? Uh, yeah, that works. Just kind of, you know, or maybe before that, we'll do it just right before that. Okay. That way, that way we'll, we'll just roll it into the agenda there and be done with it. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> hey, no, no problem. That's awesome. Um, so if, if, are we ready to go then if, if that's the case? or do we need a couple more minutes? Uh, I'm cool either way. We're ready to start the meeting. <laughs> yes, we're ready. Okay, all right, cool. So if all board members could turn on their cameras, that would be fantastic. And then we'll roll that uh, that one item in um, right after roll call. That sound good? <laughs> I think it sounds good. Um, and we're look, uh, board member Sharon has not turned his camera on. But we can start without him. We do have quorum without him. <laughs> there we go. There's that. He is. All right. All righty. So with that, apologies, my uh, um, my sound wasn't on for some reason. I didn't know we started up. Oh, that's okay. Uh, so with that, it is four thirty-eight, and I would like to call the regularly scheduled excuse me the regularly scheduled meeting of the City of Santa Rosa Design Review Board to order. So again. Uh, reminder uh, as to why we are in the virtual environment still. Uh, pursuant to Government Code Section 54953E and the recommendation of the Health Officer of the County of Sonoma, Design Review Board members will be participating in this meeting via Zoom webinar. Members of the public can participate virtually at www.zoom.us slash join or by toll-free telephone by calling 1-877-853-5257. And you can use for, for either the web or the phone call in, you can uh, please use the meeting ID 876-2004-5098. Uh, public access to the meeting uh, can be is done through the Zoom platform and uh, to provide comments during public comment period. Additional information related to meeting participation is available at the city's website, srcity.org slash design review board. Uh, the meeting will be live streamed at the city's website, Santa dash rosa dot legistar dot com slash calendar. Click on the in progress link to view. The meeting can also be viewed on Comcast channel 28 and at uh, the city's YouTube channel, youtube.com slash city of Santa Rosa. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to the recording secretary for a roll call. Let the record reflect that all board members are present. Excellent. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over <laughs> to staff uh, for uh, explanation of how to use the interpreter services that are uh, being made available during this meeting. Uh, yes, thank you, Chair Weigel. Um, so, sorry, let me get to my different screen here. Um, Okay, so we do have interpretation services joining us, um, uh, Spanish interpreters. Um, so uh, I'd like the interpreter to, um, on the Spanish channel to commence the translation of the meeting. 
live translation can be heard on the Spanish channel. To join the Spanish channel, click on the interpretation icon on your Zoom toolbar. So if you're looking at Zoom, it's gonna be on the bottom of your screen. Um, you're gonna press the three dots and then select interpretation, or you might see a globe. Um, once you join the Spanish channel, we recommend that you shut off the main audio so you can clearly hear the Spanish translation. Um, now I'd like to ask the panelists to switch over to the Spanish channel and translate. Okay. Sorry, give me a minute here. Yeah, the, so just for me, I, maybe I have an outdated Zoom platform, but I'm not seeing the live, uh, translate button or Spanish channel. All okay. I see is participants, share screen, raise hand, record, live transcript, which is the closed captioning, which is kind of cool, and uh, then apps um, after can, that. Can you try pulling it up again? I just... I had to press a different button. Can you view it now? It, it just showed up on mine. It was not there before. Okay, perfect. Apologies, that was a technical error. Yeah, and I'm not seeing it on mine, but like I said, maybe I have an older Zoom platform. Okay. It, yeah, it, it just popped up. I didn't click anything, so, um, but I believe I have clicked on the Spanish translate, but yeah, no, Dura just showed up, so. So I don't have it, but that's okay, I guess. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, so I moved the interpreter into the Spanish channel. Um, I'm going to move him back and um, see if he was successful. Bear with me here. Apologies. Interpreter Pablo. Oh, you know what? It looks like he's still in the Spanish channel. Apologies. I am seeing they both have a little ES next to their name under panelists, which is kind of cool. Right. So, yeah, maybe they're so they're in the Spanish channel now. I guess the question is, is can they hear us to translate? Right. <laughs> okay, he's back in the English channel. Um, can the interpreter please let us know if they were successful in their translation? Apology. So this is my only my second time doing this, um, but I guess once they're in the channel, they have to stay in the channel. So I think we can keep moving forward and they'll continue to translate in the Spanish channel as needed. Sounds like a plan. Thank so you. again, uh, just yeah, just let me know if there's an issue and, and you know, we can take a break and, and you know, work out the whatever technical kink we may have. Uh, so just, again, let me know uh, if we need to do that. <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's all good. <laughs> you know, I think we're all still trying to figure out this, uh, you know, virtual meeting thing sometimes, uh, you know, uh, sound going out, video breaking. <laughs> I mean, we had, we had something uh, the other day here at our office. Our teams wasn't working for some reason um, when we were having a staff meeting. So there you go. You know, <laughs> thank <laughs> just, you very much. The life of virtual meetings. Yeah. <laughs> Um, Hi. All right. So with that, Chair, I'm um, sorry to jump in here. Um, no, go ahead. It sounds like we, I don't know if any of the board members speak Spanish because we actually need someone to say in Spanish on this channel that Spanish interpretation is available on another channel since the interpreter 
is now in that other room. Um, I, I kind of, I, I, yeah, I'm sort of, I can sort of speak Spanish. Um, give me one second. I, I'll think about how to say that. Chair, I can get um, Sheila. She speaks Spanish and she can come over into my office. Uh, okay, I think maybe I have this kind of worked. Uh, la interpretación en español está disponible en el canal en español. So I just said Spanish interpretation is available on the Spanish channel. Is that good? Do I need to say anything else? Chair, do you want to repeat that one more time? Did you mention to press the icon? Oh, no, I don't know how to say that. <laughs> let, let me pass it over to, to Sheila really quickly. Yeah, that's fine. Thanks. Bueno, si quiere traducción en español, hay una imagen abajo que parece como un globo. Haz un clic en el globo y puede recibir traducción en español. Thanks, Sheila. I got I got only about half of what she said. <laughs> so good job. Thanks. Um, so with that, we'll move on uh, to the approval of the minutes. And I do not see any minutes in our board packet, so we'll just move on past that guy. And we'll go to item three, which is uh, public comment. And at this time, this is uh, any person, any member of the public may address matters not listed on the agenda, but which are within the subject matter and purview of the design review board. Um, the public may comment on agenda items when that item is called. So please do, if, if you would like to make public comment, uh, please now, please don't make comment on the scheduled item. You'll have an opportunity to do that later. Uh, each speaker is allowed three minutes during public comment, and so the recording secretary is going to break this up, and uh, she'll give uh, you a description of how to uh, to raise your hand and press star, whatever it is, in Zoom. So I'll turn it over to the recording secretary. If you're a member of the public wishing to make a comment, you can do so by selecting the raise your hand icon on your Zoom screen. Um, if you're calling in, please dial star nine. Chair Weigel, it doesn't look like we have any any hands raised. Sounds good. So with seeing no hands raised. Oh, hey, I got a we got a hands hand raised. I'll turn it back over to you recording secretary. Uh, okay. Eric or sorry, Eris Weaver, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Here. Um, can you please state your name for the record? Hi, yeah, I'm Eris Weaver of Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. Um, this is the first time that I have sat in on a meeting of this particular board, and I have, I just have to say that I'm appalled at how this whole thing with getting the translation set up was done. We've been doing meetings on Zoom for two years now, and um, I haven't seen things be this discombobulated in any other city meetings and to watch a, a room full of white men chuckling while it is not being done correctly um, is even more appalling. And I feel like the city needs to make an apology to any Spanish speakers who are over there in that other channel um, about uh, the, the lack of getting that done properly. Thanks. Thanks, Eris, for your public comment. Um, I don't see any other raised hands at this time. So with that, I will close public comment. Uh, Amy, do you have any thoughts on that before we move on? As our board liaison. 
Uh, thank you, Chair, and I, I certainly appreciate the public comment. I think there were some some technical issues. I appreciate that, um, Chair, you were um, looking up um, a way to communicate in Spanish and that we were able to get a planner over here um, quickly to relay that message. Um, but we're sometimes um, things happen. It certainly wasn't our intention, and so we were um, trying to work through the situation the best that we could. Um, thanks. Thanks, Amy, and, and I would like to say the same thing. I think, you know, um, I, I think that when we encounter technical difficulties with uh, virtual meetings, it, it is somewhat uh, humorous uh, in, in this day and age. I think we all, I, I think throughout the meeting tonight, we'll probably say, hey, by the way, you're on uh, you're on mute still, or, you know, many of those things. And, and I think, you know, many people have uh, virtual meeting fatigue, and I think that's probably what we were chuckling about, not, not anything related to the translation services. And also, this is the very first time we have had translation services available during our meeting. And so, again, this is new to us as well, and we're happy to have it. That's fantastic. Um, as, as I think everybody from the city would agree, the, the more public participation we can have in a meeting, uh, English speakers, Spanish speakers, or whatever uh, language someone may speak, that hopefully we can make things available for them uh, to be able to communicate and participate in the city's public process is uh, the ultimate goal. Uh, I think for everybody that sits on a board or is a, a city employee or an elected official. So thank you. Thank you for your public comment. We appreciate that. So with that, I'd like to move on to item number four, board business. This is where we read our statement of purpose as the design review board. Um, this comes from zoning code chapter 20-52 dot zero three zero f project review the review authority shall consider the location design site plan configuration and the overall effect of the proposed project upon surrounding properties and the city in general review shall be conducted by comparing the proposed project to the general plan any applicable specific plan ac applicable zoning code standards and requirements consistency of the project within the city's design guidelines architectural criteria for special areas and other applicable city requirements eg city policy statements and the development plan so with that, we'll move on to item 4.2, board member reports. Does anybody have any board member reports? I'm sure perhaps board member staff may have one today, tonight, I think. Oh, um, we talked a bit, a bit about this last, the last meeting. Um, this this will be my, my last um, meeting with this group. And as we talked about last week, or as I mentioned last week, um, I've thoroughly enjoyed working on this board and with this group of individuals. Thank you for, uh, for letting me be part of these discussions. Um, I'll be moving on to city council starting next week, um, but we'll, uh, we'll we'll certainly be working with each of you and with this board in the future. So thank you very much. Thanks, board member Stapp, and uh, con again, congratulations on your election to the district two council person seat. Is that correct? I get that right. Correct. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Anybody else have a board member board member report this evening? All right, seeing none, we will move on to item 4.3, uh, which is other business, and I do not believe we have any other business. So we will move on to item 5, department report. And with that, I will turn it over to our board liaison, uh, supervising planner, Amy Nicholson. Thanks, Chair. Um, I do not have any department reports today. Thanks, Amy. All right. So with that, we'll move on to item six. Uh, this is our statements of abstention uh, for scheduled items. So does anybody have a statement of abstention for scheduled item 8.1? That's all that's scheduled for this evening. All right. Not seeing any abstentions. We'll move on to item seven, consent items. We do not have any consent items tonight. So with that, we will move on to item eight. Or, which is our scheduled items, and we'll move on to item 8.1, which is a concept design review for the, excuse me, the Highway 101 bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing connecting Edwards and Elliott Avenues. Um, so with that, I'll turn it over to uh, city staff for a staff report. And typically what we have done with concept items, just to, to review this for everybody, uh, with concept items, it's a non-actionable item. Uh, so the board will review and uh, provide comment. We'll also have an opportunity for members of the public to uh, voice their opinion, same rules as uh, regular public comment, three minutes, and we'll bring up the timer. Uh, we'll do that after we do a uh, staff report and an applicant report. And I think this is a unique item because I believe the staff report and the applicant report are kind of intertwined uh, because it's a city project. Um, 
unless I'm mistaken. So uh, with that, uh, that'll be kind of the order of the operations for tonight. We'll have the uh, staff and applicant presentation, public comment, and then we'll bring it back to the board for questions and, and questions of st staff and applicant hopefully with uh, members of the public uh, informing those questions. And we always like to hear public comment. So thank you very much for attending the meeting and, and ready to bring your A game with your public comments. We appreciate that. Um, and then we'll move to comments from the board uh, on the project. And then I think we'll have a short discussion with the applicant uh, kind of on the comments and, and questions and whatnot. And then we'll likely be done with the item. So with that, I would like to turn it over to city staff for a staff report slash applicant report. Uh, for the Highway 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing Project. Good evening, everyone. Just want to make sure that the proper presenters with me on this. Um, looking for Stephen Grover. I'm here. Shall I share my screen? Yeah, uh, yeah. You have permission for control, so let's see if it works out. Perfect. I can see it. All right. I'll begin. Good evening, everybody. Uh, good evening, uh, Chair Weigel and members of the board. My name is Chris Cabbagan. I'm Associate Civil Engineer with the City's Transportation and Public Works Department. I'm managing the delivery for the US 101 Bicycle and Pedestrian Overcrossing Project known as BPOC. Uh, the project will construct a class one 14 and a half foot wide bike and pedestrian shared use crossing spanning US Highway 101 connecting LA Avenue and Edwards Avenue. Hmm. This is a crossing that is a critical link in the east to west bike ped network uh, identified in the city's bicycle and pedestrian master plan was updated in 2018. With this presentation, I have Stephen Grover, the project architect with Stephen Grover and Associates, and I also have Natalina Bernardi, she's the team's uh, design consultant project manager with EKF Engineers. And so uh, for this evening, we are here to provide bridge design updates and receive, receive input from the DRB for uh, the proposed eastern touchdown landing, fencing and railing, lighting, planting, and uh, concrete finishes, which was a request from the last DRB meeting that took place in November 4th of 2021. Um, next slide, please. So uh, today's presentation will be outlined as follows. I will provide a project status, current scheduling and targeted milestones. Stephen will provide a recap of our last DRB meeting. Uh, the team will be sharing current design refinements, and then we intend to conclude the meeting with a discussion. Next slide, please. The, as I mentioned earlier, the project will construct a class one 14 and a half foot wide bike ped shared use crossing uh, it's going the U.S. Highway 101 at the Elliott Edwards alignment. Uh, this project has been pursued by council since 2007. Um, like the, the city's 2010 bike pad master plan listed this as a project with the highest priority for both bicycle and pedestrian projects. <clears throat> uh, the project would connect and close a significant gap in the transportation network for bicyclists and pedestrians in the northern half of Santa Rosa, and it will serve as a connector providing a safer, more comfortable alternative for bicyclists and pedestrians over the freeway, highway between uh, two high traffic interchanges uh, at College Avenue and Steel Lane. Uh, the project will increase access to academics, uh, residential, commercial, and recreational areas, and as well as transit hubs. Next slide, please. Project milestones. Uh, back in 2010, a feasibility study was completed and adopted by council. The feasibility study assessed the need and purpose of the constructing a BPOC uh, adjacent to the SRJC. 
in October 2016, a project initiation document with a project study report and was developed and approved by Caltrans that, it, that identified uh, commitments that correspond to the project's scope, schedule, and cost estimate. In March 2021, we received project approval from Caltrans and an environmental clearance based on the Edwards and Elliott Bridge alignment when it was approved. In 2021, $12 million in funding was rewarded, <clears throat> awarded to this project through the Active Transportation Program by uh, MTC. And as of today, we are currently in the 95% uh, progress stage with plans and we are approaching 100%. So uh, the design began in June 2021 and we held additional public outreach events and one of them was in December 8, 2021. Next slide, please. Um, <clears throat> next steps for the project uh, in December 2022, that's next month, the city will submit our 95% plans and specifications to Caltrans with the incorporation of DRB input today. Um, again, we'll, we'll submit that to Caltrans. Uh, so the city expects that the design phase to be completed in fall or winter of 2023. And when spring 2024 comes around, we expect to break ground for construction. So construction will take approximately two years and end in the spring of 2026. And um, yeah, I would like to introduce Mr. Stephen Grover, Stephen Grover and his associates. We've been lucky uh, because Stephen Grover has been the architect in the project since its uh, beginning inceptions in 2007. So Stephen Grover, please, next slide. Please. Thank you, Chris. We're pleased to provide the board tonight or with an update about the design of Santa Rosa's bicycle and pedestrian overcrossing project. <clears throat> Excuse me. This presentation will begin with a brief recap of the design elements presented last November to the DRB. I will then discuss the items we were asked by the DRB to return with. I wanna note here that Caltrans is also a key stakeholder for the project particularly for the portion within the state right-of-way, and they are also reviewing the proposed design at this time. Last November, we presented to the DRB how the project's location, alignment, and structure type were selected. We also presented the proposed design for the bridge approaches and the main span. At that time, the DRB expressed concurrence with our proposed project location and affirmed the offset single pylon cable stayed bridge structure type proposed. The board also expressed a preference that the light and contemporary design is kept as clean and open as possible to maximize views and visual transparency. The board also affirmed the proposed configuration for the West touchdown shown here. I'd also like to note that the Santa Rosa community has expressed an interest in incorporating public art into this project. <clears throat> At last November's DRB meeting, the board stated that the bridge itself should stand as art. So if any additional artwork is to be included, it should be off the structure so as not to distract from the bridge's overall clean and simple lines. Accordingly, the design team identified several areas outside the state right-of-way and on city property where public art could occur. Here in the shaded areas in the plan view at the top are some potential public art locations adjacent to the Edwards Avenue sidewalk on the west side of Highway 101. And here are some potential public art locations on the east side. I'd also like to note that on April 4th of 2022, city staff presented this project to Santa Rosa's Art in Public Places Committee. The committee at that time supported making the public art around the bridge a project within the city's public art program but a separate project from, from this um, bridge project. And the city staff um, 
has committed to continuing to coordinate with that committee. The last time we presented the design, this board requested that we return after we've examined further how the taller safety fencing over Highway 101 could better transition at each end. Here's our proposed refined fencing termination design. We are proposing a stainless steel fencing and railing system. <clears throat> the stanchions and rails from 304 stainless steel with a, a mill finish. The cable mesh is also stainless steel. And the traveled way surfaces you, that you see here would be polyester concrete with the bikeway portion colored to replicate the look of asphalt and the walking lane colored to complement the pavers at each end of the bridge at the touchdown areas, which define pedestrian or multimodal mixing zone areas. <clears throat> Here's an example of the same type of cable mesh fencing used on a similar project. And here are some of the details for the fencing and railing. Better understand the level of transparency provided by this type of fence infill. Here's a photo of a project that used the same size cable mesh fence material. And here's another view a little bit more head on. Here is an image at the corner of Armory and Elliott showing how the railing and fencing elements will integrate with other project elements such as the bridge deck, the backstays, and the pylon near the corner. The board also requested that the design team return to present an updated design for the east landing area. Here's an image of what we presented previously. This was a preliminary concept pending further coordination with the junior college. Following that coordination with the SRJC and with the design team for the new student housing building adjacent to this project, we updated the design of the east landing area. Here's another view of it with some of the trees removed so you can see the hardscape elements better. We are proposing that the pathways connecting to this east touchdown area be colored and finished to match new pathways as specified for the new Santa Rosa Junior College student housing project. We're proposing concrete pavers at both the touchdown areas and also at this south facing seat wall in order to define more passive areas for mixing and pedestrian activities. We're proposing a herringbone pattern with blended colors to better mesh with the colors of the traveled way surfaces on the bridge approaches in the main span. For the seat walls themselves, we're proposing a light colored concrete with an acid etched surface. The refined east touchdown design uses trees, some small berming, and these seat walls to create an outdoor room. a wide curving pathway with new planting on either side and a retaining wall with integrated seating will connect the touchdown plaza for this project with the new student housing building. Here's a view of the east touchdown as seen from the east approach. And here is the east approach and bridge structure as seen from the east touchdown.
We're proposing strip lighting at the base of the seat walls to define the perimeter of this outdoor room and some small point sources at the ends of the seat walls to better mark the entries to this area and also to help keep cyclists from hitting them. The configuration of the West Touchdown remains unchanged as I mentioned previously. However, we've refined the architectural vocabulary here to be in keeping with the rest of the project. Again, here, strip lighting at the base of the seat walls and some small face-mounted fixtures at each end for safety. We're proposing a very low level wash, up light wash of the pylon, uh, a level just to provide a, a small amount of drama, but without creating a distraction for drivers or making it difficult to focus on the exit sign. The lighting for the traveled way is proposed to be rail mounted fixtures that just light the traveled way surface itself and don't create glare for that gets in the, the eyes of cyclists. Here's a project we designed that was recently completed in Marin County using the exact same light fixtures, rail mounted light fixtures. We included these landscape, uh, the planting list and the planting plans uh, so that they would be in your packet in case you wanted to review them in advance. I'll skip through them for now. At the bottom of the pylon at the corner of Armory and Elliott, we hope that the planting here uh, will create a bit of a visual base from which the structural elements, the pylon and the thrust block can emerge. And ideally, the bridge structure will appear to float above these landscape elements. Here's a view from the south side of that same area. I want to note that the representations of the stalked aeonium plant here are a bit improvised. We didn't have those in our library. What I do want to point out here in this view, however, is that um, on the right side of the image, it's a concrete deck. And on the left side, uh, starting where the outrigger is, it's a steel deck structure. Now, we worked very hard with the structural um, engineers on this project to uh, de design the structure so that we could have a, an unbroken geometric continuity uh, between these two um, materials. And so for the finished treatments, we are attempting to retain that sense of continuity uh, the concrete portion will be smooth formed, uncolored concrete, and the steel portion painted to match. The vines on the south side of the west approach walls are intended to soften the appearance for this residential context and also deter graffiti. We have selected a plant that will grow only on the wire trellises, so it will not become a maintenance headache by growing beyond the intended limits. The concrete for these walls will be uncolored with a vertical board form texture. Of course, the concrete deck sitting above these walls will be smooth formed, as I mentioned previously. In response to community and adjacent property owner input, you may recall that the sidewalk geometry here along Edwards is intended to activate this sheltered area under the west approach. The plants and boulders have also been selected to help deter encampment and keep pedestrians from cutting through the landscaping. In keeping with the environmental document commitments for the project, 
the pylon will be painted a light color, essentially a shade of white or light gray that complements the natural context as well as the other finishes proposed for the architectural elements in this project. I'd like to note that we will be requiring a large scale field mock-up during construction to confirm final finish and color selections. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your time and attention. We look forward to your discussion and we'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Thanks, <clears throat> thanks, Stephen and Chris. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to move to uh, public comment. Uh, and it uh, looks like we have several members of the public tonight uh, that, are, that have joined our meeting. So um, if you would like to make public comment on this project, please uh, raise your hand in the Zoom platform uh, and the recording secretary will recognize you. And then uh, they're also gonna put, on, put up the uh, Three minute timer there. Um, so with that, I, uh, I'm seeing some hands. Uh, so, and then we'll review uh, the recording secretary will review uh, how to do do that, and uh, we'll get the timer going and uh, we'll take public comment. Really excited to hear what you guys have to say. In case you missed the instruction at the start of the meeting, if you want to raise your hand um, to make a public comment, please do so by selecting the raise your hand icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen. If you're calling in, please press star nine. Um, I see Alexa Forrester has her hand raised. Alexa, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. And can you please state your name for the record? Hi everybody, can you hear me? Uh, my name is Alexa okay. Forrester. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, my name is Alexa Forrester and I am very interested in this project. I think the design is really beautiful and I wish I could blink my eyes and have it there tomorrow. Um, I am calling in both as a professor at Santa Rosa Junior College. So I my office is just down the street from the site. My students would use this bridge all of the time and I would also use it as both a cyclist and a pedestrian. Um, uh, and so, I, and I, I am also one of the co-leads of uh, Bikeable Santa Rosa, which is a community organization um, campaign advocating for connected and protected bikeways. And so I agree that this is an essential linking component um, for our overall city network. Um, I had one design question. I'll just, I'll make both my questions and then I'll hand it back over to you. I had one design question and then one question um, for the project manager overall. Um, the design question is that the, but the two wave cycle track envisioned here is at the absolute minimum of uh, width for a cycle track recommended, um, uh, you know, by various designers, uh, including the um, uh, National uh, uh, Association of City Transportation Officials is eight feet. And so that had been a concern for me if there was going to be a big curb between the sidewalk and the cycle track. Um, in earlier designs, there had been an angle mounted, uh, a mountable curb there, but then in this, the designs that you just showed, it looked like maybe we're just gonna go flat across the whole thing with just color differential. Um, so I just wanna uh, put a word in for either an angle mountable curb or um, flat across the whole bridge rather than having a curb breaking up um, the pedestrian and the bicycle uh, lanes. Um, so I just wanted to know what the what it's gonna look like and, and advocate for something that will allow flexibility for both pe pedestrians and cyclists in emergency situations. Um, then my other question about the project as a whole, I was just on the city council meeting last uh, on Tuesday and the city council just decided to take $3.4 million that was earmarked for this project and send it, spend it on Hearn Avenue instead. And so I'm wondering if the project manager was factoring that into timelines. And I just want to say that this has raised a lot of concern among the people that I you know, advocate with that this project may be delayed. And so I'm wondering if we can, you know, uh, if you could speak to the overall timeline in light of that. And the other question I had related to that 
was that on the city council meeting, the city is projecting that the Hearn Avenue overcrossing, which is five lanes of traffic plus bicycle and pedestrian infrastructure, is slated to cost three point six or sorry, thirty six million. And then they had the estimated cost of this one at thirty four million. And that just seems a little bit perplexing that a bridge like this would cost almost as much as the Hearn Avenue. So I'm wondering if either the architect or the project manager can speak to those cost estimates and how that might impact the completability of this project. Thank you. Thanks for your public comment. Um, typically what we do is uh, we'll, we'll collect, you know, like questions like that. Um, and then after kind of public comment, uh, generally I try to, uh, you know, take the questions of city and staff and I'll, from the public and I'll ask them, um, and, uh, we'll kind of get them all addressed at once. So I, I heard a couple there and I wrote them down and, and, uh, we will continue to do so. So with that, we'll turn it over to the next, uh, public call and thanks Alexa for your thoughts and questions. The. Um, alrighty. Uh, next we have Steve Bertelbell. Apologies if I butchered your last name. Um, I'm going to give you permissions to speak and can you please state your name for the record? Thank you, Chair and members. Uh, Steve Bertelbell with the Transportation Land Use Coalition. <clears throat> I'm pleased to see this project moving slowly, uh, not so slowly. I hope it would move faster. Um, but uh, it's good to see it happening. I do hope that the uh, money that the city has borrowed, it will be repaid by by the time we can get this going. And uh, uh, I just want to recall that uh, in 2007, we tried to decide how wide this should be. And all of us tried it in uh, uh, one of the meeting rooms, and uh, I'm, I'm glad to finally see it happening. Let's move it quickly. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. Um, I'm, we're going to, it looks like we have a small technical glitch there on the timer. Um, you only spoke for about 30 seconds, so not a big deal. Uh, oh. But we'll move on to the next person. I'm going to let uh, the recording secretary let me know uh, they've got that little timer glitch fixed before we move on. Apologies. Um, let me give me a second. I just want to make sure my co host is ready. All good. And uh, I did, while I, I noticed we kind of cut Alexa off there, um, Alexa, if, if, uh, if when we, we bring it back to the board and we ask questions, if I happen to miss one, uh, you're welcome to email me at my city email address, which is dweigel at srcity.org, and I'm more than happy to make sure I get the, the questions answered. Um, so again, that's D Weigel, so D-W-E-I-G-L at srcity.org, if I miss something. Um, so I want give to you, give you that. Any, anybody's welcome to email me if, if we miss a question or, or whatever, uh, if you have um, a public comment question that we've missed, because uh, we want to make sure that we get those uh, answered for you guys, and, and probably for us. So it looks like we're ready to go on uh, the timer there. Okay. Uh, Chair Weigel, apologies. Um, can we just take a one minute break so I can step over there and help her out really quick? Sure. Okay. Um, apologies. Uh, I mean, we can, uh, while they do that, uh, can you go ahead and just, yeah, there we go. Um, so while we, I mean, we don't need to take a little break right now. Uh, we can just pause public comment. This is a okay. know, concept meeting, so we don't have to like <laughs> take a recess or anything. Um, so maybe I'll just re uh, review these questions that we've been heard already and see if I heard them right. Two way cycle track, what's the minimum width? Eight feet is the industry standard. Did everybody else hear that? I wanna make sure we got that one. Speak to the overall construction timeline. Uh, and then there was a question about the, the Hearn versus the bridge uh, cost differential, right? Everybody hear that? Or did I miss anything? Okay, cool. Awesome. It, yeah, and, yeah, and Drew, to add to that, um, Alexa was also asking about um, how this the money 
uh, allocation to earn would affect could potentially affect this timeline. Oh, right. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I heard that. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. I want to make sure I get that written. All right. Looks like are we are we cooking with gas now on the uh, the timer? <laughs> All right, so we'll turn it over to the recording secretary and the timer, and uh, looks like next person up is John Sutter. So, recording secretary. Uh, yes, thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, so, John Sutter, I'm gonna give you permissions to speak. Can you please state your name for the record? So it looks like John is unmuted, but I'm not hearing any uh, sound. Is, every, is that the case with everybody else? Okay. Um, so I'm gonna go back to the recording secretary and the host. Uh, are you guys seeing any technical issues on John's side? Outdated Zoom platform, et cetera? No, I, uh, John, I gave you permissions to speak. I also see that you are unmuted. So um, I'm going to make this recommendation as we've done before, uh, John. Uh, so it does not appear that uh, any sound is coming through uh, from uh, whatever device you're logged in with. So I would recommend um, if you have the uh, option, if you could call in using the uh, toll-free number, 1-877-853-5257, and enter the meeting ID 876-2004-5098. Um, and then uh, enter the, the meeting that way via phone. Uh, we'd love to hear your comment. Um, and so, uh, but it does not appear that sound is coming through right now from your device. So uh, I'd like to move on to the next uh, public comment person, please. Got it. Uh, Chris Gwenther, I'm gonna send you a prompt to unmute yourself. Can you please state your name for the record? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? We can, thank you. Please state your name. Excellent. Uh, my name is Chris Gunther uh, and I'm a Santa Rosa resident, um, mostly in the Bennett Valley area or Northern Bennett Valley, but um, also spend time uh, traversing this part of the city. I was actually on the west side today and was um, uh, lamenting the the difficulty of getting around back to the east side so this would be a great improvement i think the design looks really really beautiful i want to um, commend especially the fencing improvements um, which versus the earlier renderings i think really makes the bridge stand out and will make it a great asset not only for bikers and pedestrians but also just to the visual um, uh, impact of the city um, from a number of angles in that part of the city, which fortunately or unfortunately right now is, is not much to look at. Um, <clears throat> just a couple of things from, from my perspective. One is just to reiterate some of what Alexa said, I think especially around the divide between the lanes. Um, I, I think she clarified that eight feet is the absolute minimum of, of the recommended, whereas the actual recommended width is 12 feet. And I think that's mitigated if obviously both pedestrians and cyclists have the option of you know crossing into the other lane especially if they're um you know cross or passing somebody on the other going in the other direction that has a wider bike or a wheelchair or what have you um so good to have some flexibility there i assume it's out of the question to widen the bridge at this point but for what it's worth wider would be better for the bikeway um so you know take that or leave it um, <clears throat> I want to, I know this is not really the purview of, of this committee or what we're discussing tonight, but I just want to take the chance to reiterate how important it is that, especially with a marquee project like this, that we are also attending to 
the state of the bike infrastructure on either side of the bridge on the street. And unfortunately, right now, on the Elliott Avenue, on Armory Drive, um, and on Edwards on the, on the west side, the bike infrastructure is really not up to the standards that this bridge would make you want it to be um, in terms of making this a really, really integral part of the city's bike network. So I hope that in the time that it takes to construct this bridge, that we'll continue to work on that. And I know the folks who do work on that are probably listening. So this is for them. Um, the last thing I'll say is I really like uh, some of what um, was mentioned about um, trying to activate the area under the bridge on the west side. I'm still a little bit concerned that it's a little isolated over there. And again, without better bike infrastructure, the fact that it's on the side of the businesses that are there on Cleveland Avenue um, is a little bit of an issue. And I hope that there's maybe some collaboration um, with those businesses around visibility and safety uh, for that area. That's all. Thanks, Chris. We appreciate your comments. Um... I did want to, uh, it looks like there might be a new phone caller that might be our, our friend John Suter there. I uh, wanted to remind him that um, you have to press star, star nine on your phone to raise your hand. So if that is indeed John who called in, please press star nine to raise your hand and we'll recognize you accordingly. So with that, uh, the next person, please recording trip. Sarah Weaver, I'm going to give you permissions to speak. Um, and can you please state your name for the record? Hi, the Eris Weaver, Executive Director of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. I cannot wait to ride across this bridge. It's beautiful. A um, uh, couple of questions. I don't want to repeat anything that's already been said. I really appreciated that you showed the real life slide from the other bridge showing what the lights look like at night. Um, as a woman who rides alone and often rides at night, one of the safety compromises or decisions I always have to make is, do I take my chances with the traffic and ride on the street? Or do I take my chances with, you know, weird people I can't see because there's no lights on the class existing class one paths, most of which are unlit. And so how the um, how the infrastructure is lit is very important to me. And it looks uh, good on the span itself. It was less clear to me what the lighting is like at either end as you're approaching and getting off um, because of course that needs to, you know, needs to be visible as well. Um, I had another thought and it seems to have evaporated into the ether. Um, so I will just trust that whatever it was, someone else will come up with it as well. Thanks. Thanks, Eris, for your thoughts. Um, and with that, uh, we'll move on to the next uh, public comment. Uh, Jenny Bard, I'm going to give you permissions to speak. Can you please state your name for the record? Hi, yes, this is Jenny Bard, and I, too, am very excited to be here to support the overpass and the design. Um, you know, as others have said, we, we've been waiting for this bridge for well, I know that it started in 2007, but we've been waiting for it for when we started talking about it for more than 20 years. So um, I can't wait to ride my bike across the bridge. I've lived in Santa Rosa for 35 years, mostly in the JC neighborhood. And I am currently the president of the Sonoma County Bicycle Coalition. And you, know, we are very, very excited to see this project uh, come to, to fruition. So as others have said, and I have spoken to this in the past, but again, uh, knowing this is a design discussion, but as it relates to connectivity, um, could you speak to what discussions are taking place, particularly with the JC uh, and other property owners regarding what additional bicycle infrastructure will be considered to really make bicycling safe and inviting, um, such as protected bicycle lanes, lower car speeds on key corridors and connectors, because, you know, ideally we want everybody to, to ride uh, across this bridge, to walk across this bridge. And so, you know, for cyclists of all ages and abilities to feel comfortable getting there, 
we need to make sure that we have safe corridors uh, for them to bicycle to and from the bridge. And then um, regarding the design, I, um, I know that the design review board uh, did decide not to include art on the bridge and believing that the art is in itself excuse me, the bridge is in itself art, um, and it is truly, truly beautiful, but, um, and, and that you're putting the art on the, you know, at the base of the bridge um, on either side. And I, I do appreciate that, but uh, I do think that there are more opportunities on the bridge to make a bolder statement uh, regarding like the city's commitment to address climate change and, and somehow perhaps looking at the walking path, which right now the, the, the cross, um, the cycle track and the pedestrian path could be a place for messages as you're walking across the bridge. It could be a place for uh, inspiration. Um, we're gonna, each of us will have, be spending a little time on there. So it's an opportunity for art, perhaps painted art or, worked into the uh, the pavement itself in some way. So I just want to encourage um, to you to think about that. Um, but in the end, I'm so thrilled to see this project come forward and uh, thank you all very, very much. Thanks, Jenny, for your comments. Uh, it looks like uh, we have another raised hand there. A couple, uh, no, just uh, John, it looks like. So with that, I'll turn it back over to the recording secretary. John Sutter, <clears throat> John Sutter, um, I'm gonna send you permissions to speak. If you are calling in, you can press star nine, or sorry, star six to unmute yourself. John, um, we still can't hear you. I think the issue might be you need to update your Zoom. Um, if you can, please call in. Um, the phone number is 877-853-5254. And the meeting ID is 876-2004-5098. Uh, thanks for that. So it looks like uh, John's continuing to have some technical difficulties. So uh, in the absence of other raised hands, uh, I'd like to close public comment. But what we've done in the past, again, since this is a uh, concept meeting and it, it's not a public hearing, uh, you know, uh, for an actionable mm -hmm. item, uh, if John can either call in or update his Zoom or what have you, uh, if we see his hand pop up again uh, later in the meeting, uh, we'll take a pause uh, with what we're discussing and we'll turn it over to him for some for his public comment uh, because we do want to hear from him. So uh, before I completely close public comment, uh, I want to. Give everybody one last shot to raise their hand if they have anything to say. And not seeing any, uh, I'd like to move on. So with that, uh, we'll go ahead and close public comment. And like I said, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and leave it open there for Mr. Sutter uh, if we see him again, and uh, we'll go to him uh, to hear his comment. But with that, uh, I'd like to bring it back to the board uh, for questions of uh, city staff and the applicants. Uh, but I wanted to start with a, a couple of these items uh, that we heard from the public. To try to get those out, out in front. Is that good with everybody? All right. So um, if we could maybe bring up the, uh, the presentation again, uh, Stephen Grover, if you could share your presentation again and go to page 31, that would be helpful. It's the uh, view of the landing near Dix, uh, looking south, night view. 
or sorry, the other one, that's the JC side, thank you. So somebody had a question about how the landings are lit uh, on either side. So on page 31 and 33 of the presentation are uh, renderings of the lit landings. Um, so uh, Stephen, did you wanna go over that a little bit more? Just uh, again, reiterate how those landings are lit. Sure, I mentioned the strip lighting at the base of the seat walls to help define the perimeter, especially uh, for cyclists or pedestrians who are coming down the ramp <clears throat> so that they have a clear sense of where they need to watch out for an obstacle. Um, I mentioned also the, the little point source lights at each end of those structures to again, mark those corners uh, as obstacles. What I failed to mention was the um, pole mounted light fixtures you see here in the foreground. Uh, there's one that lights this area, gives some area light, and there are similar lights on the east side, pole mounted fixtures. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, if you could go back and be two pages in the presentation so we could see the uh, other other landing there. And uh, those are the, there's the pole lights that Stephen's talking about, uh, lighting that kind of roundabout. Um, so I think we got that question answered. Um, so I think this next question here, Stephen, is also for you. Um, what is the total width of the bridge travel lane? And then what is the width of both the pedestrian lane and the bike lane? So the bikeway consists of a total of nine feet. That's eight feet for the, um, the two way cycle track and a, and a one foot shy distance. And then there's a six inch, one and a half inch tall mountable curb, which I wanna emphasize we've done mock-ups and experiments with, and it's very, very traversable by basically anybody because it's so low. But it does also really help reinforce the sense that this is where pedestrians can feel safe and, and that bicycles will only veer into this area if they really need to pass somebody. Um, the, but the, the sidewalk area is five feet wide. Um, if I may, I should also mention that we determined very early on that mode separation is an important feature for this project, given the expected uh, mode split. Uh, the vicinity, the, the proximity of the smart station means that we do expect some, what I'll call pulsing of pedestrians as well as cyclists um, at the same time that we'll need to share this facility. And lastly, I'll just mention that um, the width is very constrained. We jumped through a lot of uh, contortions to eke out the width that we are um, providing in the design. Uh, we really can't squeeze any more given the constraints of the, the site. Excellent, thanks so much, Stephen. Uh, so the next couple of questions I really think are for city staff, and um, I, I think city staff may not have the answers to all of these, and, and that's okay, um, but I thought we'd at least ask them and, and see kind of, uh, you know, perhaps if city staff is aware of kind of other <coughs> discussions or, or development occurring beyond the boundaries of, the, uh, of this particular project. So the first one, I wanted to ask is um, what kinds of discussions are happening with the junior college business owners or other stakeholders uh, in terms of developing, developing the immediately surrounding bike infrastructure, if any? Well, I'll go ahead and I'll field this question. Uh, Chris Kevagan, City of Santa Rosa. Uh, I think for the last uh, five years, we've been in contact with uh, the SRJC and uh, particularly their uh, capital um, director. And we still meet on a monthly basis and uh, meet with their architects regarding um, two projects. One is their SRJC uh, student housing and uh, the BAPOC bridge itself. So we're in constant communication in terms of just the landings. And uh, <clears throat> I think the SRJC um, is concerned about um, the, the road segment that that runs through uh, through Elliott, and so um, they have communications with our uh, transportation group. And uh, with that being said, uh, there's constant uh, uh, information 
being passed along. And so we do take a lot of these things into consideration when we uh, continue with their design. But yeah, there, there's constant communication, frequent communication with us or JC. Thanks, Chris. I appreciate that. And then uh, also tied to that, I think there was a general question about kind of just bike infrastructure in general in the city. And I'm sure that um, your department looks at that, uh, you know, obviously on a case by case basis in terms of, you know, what roads are being improved or projects are occurring, et cetera. Could you speak to that just uh, in, in a very broad sense? So, yeah, well, so maybe, the, oh, go ahead, Nancy. Yeah. So, timing. yeah. So I'm going to introduce myself. So um, I'm Nancy Adams and I'm also in the, uh, transportation and public works department. My my position is in the traffic engineering um, team, and I am um, the liaison for our bike and ped um, advisory board that's uh, city council appointed. So, um, and my colleague Rob Sprinkle, he's um, our traffic engineer, and and um, we have been working with the community probably over the last year and a half, um, just in terms of bike and pedestrian. Um, connections throughout our community and and the whole genesis of, of these uh, corridor meetings with the, with our community um, uh, is is based on our bike and ped master plan that which identified um, you know some some opportunities for us to continue to explore uh, safe and comfortable connections um, by studying them which which is what we've been doing for the last uh, year and a half and um, we, as a result of these uh, inputs that we're receiving from the community and um, just uh, looking at where we can, um, you know, add and, and enhance spike and, and, and uh, pedestrian facilities, um, we, we've looked at uh, Mendocino Avenue. Um, there's been a several um, conversations around that from college down to fourth, and we're looking at, you know, trying to incorporate uh, buffered facilities within those roadways. And, and you know, it, uh, some of the callers have been active participants in those community meetings. So we, we're, we're doing, you know, we're doing the, 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 the work to, to put in to try to identify, um, you know, where we can really make those more buffered and separated with vertical elements within our roadways. Um, but it, it's it's a work in progress, right? So I think the the the, the key is that um, you know know that we're doing it, but it, it does take time, and and um, w with the support of of the you know of our residents, we'll get there. But um, it's it's just incremental, right? And once you identify what you need to do, then you have to find the funding to to, to make those improvements. So it's it's very incremental, but we are we're, we're progressing, which is a good thing. Excellent. So then uh, the next one uh, here is uh, a question about kind of the overall timeline. Um, and then they were, I guess someone was asking about the impact of, uh, I guess, what city council approved in terms of the Hearn uh, improvements as it relates to the overall timeline with this project. Um, can you potentially speak to that? Sure. Yeah, I'll do that as well. So, um, uh, I'll start first, uh, Nancy. I'm, oh, I'm actually the, the project manager for the Hearn Avenue right. Interchain Bridge, too. And again, we're working in conjunction with Caltrans. <clears throat> uh, what I will say is that uh, uh, Hearn Avenue Interchange uh, <clears throat> is scheduled to go into construction in uh, October 2023. So uh, with that being said, uh, before you can go into construction, we have to find ways to uh, secure funding or to get it, uh, they call it RTL, but uh, advertised and awarded. And for this particular project, uh, the BPOC, uh, we're hoping to go to construction shovel ready in June 2024. So that's roughly uh, just a little, a little bit under a year. But um, those are two bridge projects that uh, we, we plan to get constructed, but uh, I'll go on and turn it over to uh, and Nancy to, to discuss uh, how that transferring money began and um, where that is right now. Okay, so 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 thanks, Chris. I apologize for jumping in too soon. So um, just a big a big backdrop, right? So we've got these two major 
um, investments that we, we've been that that have been on the books for for many years, and um, it's it, it's it's been a struggle to get you know the Hearn Avenue interchange to the finish line um, because it's been it's been designed right. And to Chris's point, it, it's it's ready to go. We just need to to, to get the funding there. And we were able to partner with the Sonoma County Transportation Authority, um, which is our, our um, county funding, transportation funding agency, um, to develop a funding strategy, which Jason Nutt, our assistant city manager, um, presented to our city council um, Tuesday, right? And so, um, you know, and if, if you listen to the, to the recording, you know, one of the comments that the mayor made was, and he's he's the mayor is the chair of the Sonoma County Transportation Authority. Um, one of the comments is he made is it's you know we can have two major investments um, that we are are ready, but we don't have all the funding, or we can get one of them you know under construction. And uh, to, to Chris's point, Hearn is ready to go, right? And there were some funding constraints that we were um, able to secure that had to be. Um, allocated by June of next year. So in order for us to, to move that money into Hearn and make it all come together, it's, it, it's, a, very, it's a very complicated process. But, um, you know, the goal of the city is to get both of them funded. And, and Council Member Fleming was instrumental in getting the $3.4 million from the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, which she is a, a commissioner of. And um, that money was one of the things that that the council had to to agree to shift that that funding to to Hearn to make that funding package work for Hearn. And so she was pretty pretty direct with with the with the assistant city manager and the city manager about, well, you, you know, do we is this is this going to jeopardize the the bike pedal we're crossing? And and you know, are we still committed to to getting that to the finish line? And I I think. The answer is yes, because we have we have um, a twelve million dollar commitment already for active transportation funding that we were awarded, and the the strategy is that we have a little more time to to cobble together the money that was taken from from the over the bike pet overcrossing um, to to Chris's point because we're not we're not yet yet there in terms of going to to a, a contract award. We have about eighteen months, right? So, um, you know, I, I think we've positioned ourselves, um, you know, with, with the council's acknowledgement there Tuesday in, in a, you know, in, in the best position we can as a city to, to deliver, you know, the Hearn project and to follow up delivering very shortly um, after that with the bike pit over crossing. So, so you know, um, there was some pretty, pretty heavy lifting by the council members, but, um, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it you you got to think about all these financial strategies when you've got two significant investments that we're trying to get you know to the finish line and a lot of the costs I know the cost has come up and Chris is probably a better better to respond to this but a lot of the the questions around the, the cost of these projects is is because as you know the last eighteen months you, the, the the price of of materials has has just skyrocketed so. Therein lies, you know, why it's so important to to capitalize on on you know getting these things out to bid, and and if there's any savings that we um, res that results with the award of the Hearn, which you know might the bids might come lower than what we had anticipated, you know those are those will be things that we'll look at in terms of will will that money go into back into the bike pit over crossing. So there's just a lot of moving parts and. Um, you know, I know that there's been some cons uh, questions asked about it, but um, hopefully you, that's a little bit of the political and the the big the big picture conversation that's that's happened around those two projects. So hopefully that helps. Thanks, Nancy. Appreciate that. And uh, I think the last question here uh, was related to money. And so, uh, but it, I think it's a little bit different than what you've already kind of addressed in that uh, uh, the member of the public was interested in, I guess, kind of the me mechanics of why the Hearn overcrossing and this pedestrian bridge had a cost, had costs that were similar to one another. And I guess 
uh, based on, I guess, the, the, the scope of the Hearn Bridge versus the scope of the, the pedestrian overcross. If you could maybe talk, maybe you or Chris. Yeah, that or, or I can, even, I can even. speak about that. I think in regards to the, the comparable cost of the Hearn Avenue interchange and the BPOC is, uh, you know, intuition would tell you that um, <clears throat> I mean, because the Hearn Avenue interchange has a bigger uh, building footprint, um, you think it costs much more than, uh, you know, uh, just a pedestrian uh, bike path. But uh, the, the truth is that the Hearn Avenue interchange is a concrete girder uh, beam that could be pre prefab and then dropped in as opposed to um, you know, the BPOC actually being uh, uh, materials made out of steel. And then even uh, with some of these federal ad, the federal aid uh, <clears throat> grant conditions that uh, the whole Buy America clause where you have to buy steel manufactured and, and made in America. And so um, with that being said, uh, yeah, um, Hearn Avenue, uh, you know, it does have a bigger thing, uh, footprint, but uh, again, it just it comes down to materials. And fortunately, steel is a hard product to come across in, in the U.S. Chris, may I uh, add to that? Sure. Stephen, um, I, I just want to mention uh, for the public that the site constraints at the location chosen for the bicycle and pedestrian bridge are such that a conventional concrete structure is just not feasible. Uh, a very thin deck, long span structure is required here, and that uh, costs significantly more. So that in addition to the right of way acquisition, utility relocations, uh, construction management, and the skyrocketing steel costs uh, all combined to make comparable um, construction cost numbers. Cool. Thank you, Chris and Stephen. We really appreciate that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think I think the big takeaway, at least for me, is that you have kind of a kit of parts component for the the the, the road crossing, right? Which is, I think, um, you know, any anybody who drives a car, drives around town, drives around the state of California, the U.S., you see a lot of precast concrete uh, overcrossing bridges. Um, it's a very standard kind of construction methodology, uh, and there, there, you know, there's a wide right of way at Hearn, from what I understand, that was part of that process, and so that particular uh, design solution presented itself. Um, and as Stephen indicated, um, there were heavy site constraints for the bike pedestrian overcrossing, and because of that, um, it's it's not a kit of parts that's available or a prefab system. Uh, they had to design something that fit within the the boundaries. Of what was available, and and find a solution that was not only uh, you know attractive, but also economical as economical as possible uh, for this condition. I think that maybe summarizes it, at least what I'm hearing, and my takeaway. Um, so with that, uh, I don't have any other questions from the public aside from art, but I know the board will likely have some questions about that, so I'll leave it to them. So with that. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and go to uh, board member Sharon for questions of staff and applicants. Excellent. Thank you, Chair Weigel. All right. And thank you, staff. Thank you, Chris, for the presentation. And thank you, applicant team, for bringing this back to us. Do appreciate it. Um, in terms of questions, um, yeah, I, d I definitely support all the questions that the members of the public um, brought up some really great, uh, insightful and incisive questions too. So um, thanks for everyone for, for chiming in and for showing up. Um, uh, my one question that, uh, that hasn't um, necessarily been addressed yet is um, uh, the placement of the uh, proposed art. Um, it is uh, uh, underneath the the bridge for the most part or often the the landscape and i'm just wondering um one of the uh, uh pieces of feedback we gave last year was to uh, look at the landings as well um and the entrance and exits for this uh just wondering um uh the rationale um i know it's a work in progress and is coming um later um in the in the process as well but uh as far as what we're being evaluating today um there the artwork is not in the um, the landings. So I'm just kind of uh, curious about your rationale for the placement. Thank you. 
One of the challenges with a project like this is, is coordination um, and uh, putting the art component in place where it could be handled easily as a separate project and designed independently is a key consideration in order to not slow down uh, this project. I think that was one of the main um, reasons why it's it's just harder to incorporate it. At, at the okay. Way. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, they, what you do, I, I definitely under, understand that and understand wanting to move with as much alacrity as possible. Um, and uh, the what you what you have proposed though in, in the presentation. Um, are basic are our placeholders and they're placeholders in the landscape and they're you know potentially could be placeholders in landings or seat walls or things like that um but uh, uh thank you for the answer any other questions adam that is it for me thank you guys all right awesome thanks adam uh i'm gonna go to board member staff now I'd like to thank the members of the public and city staff as well for some some excellent questions and um, clarifying conversations. Um, I don't have any I don't have any further questions of my own right now. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. Uh, board Member McHugh, any questions of the applicant and or staff? Yes, I actually do have a question. And uh, one of the things that we talked about when this came before us before were the fencing terminations. And in your presentation, you identified those, but you really didn't speak to what uh, uh, what we had talked about in, in those terminations and perhaps blending them better uh, in the design than, than what you had currently proposed uh, uh, back in, in uh, November. So I was wondering if staff could speak to that and uh, let us know what your, uh, what your plans are. Can you see my screen? I can. We we can. Yeah, I was I was actually going to say, can you turn to page sixteen? <laughs> I think one of the key criticisms and concerns was the abrupt kind of rectilinear uh, termination of the higher fencing at each end. Uh, so what we've tried to do is uh, terminate it a, a, a little bit more gracefully, but still within the confines of what's feasible structurally using a cable and cable mesh system. And uh, so what happens here is the, uh, I don't know if I can annotate. Uh, this is a tension cable that carries the top of the cable mesh. It passes over this stanchion and then it anchors to this lower railing stanchion. And then you can see another diagonal member that carries it down. So you would faintly see that the way that the forces are carried down to the deck. Well, thank you very much. I didn't quite, I couldn't pick, I didn't pick that up or you went by it faster than, than uh, I understood it. So thank you very much for clarifying that for me. Thanks, John. Anything else? No, that's it. All right, and with that, I will go to Vice Chair Birch for any questions of the applicant and staff. Great, thank you very much. My, my voice is not returned in two weeks, so I'm a bit croaky, so I hope that uh, I'm easy enough to understand. The um, one question that I have is, is um, the process now for selecting the color of the tower, and I think you said, you know, you, you indicated, I think there were six variations that appeared in sort of small scale format in the presentation. Um, overall, it, we have we have concrete and we have stainless steel and then uh, and the cables are stainless as well, I'm guessing, and all of their <clears throat> hardware and turnbuckles and all the important bridge parts are all going to be stainless. But uh, the tower itself, um, how is that who is going to make that selection? How is that going to be made? Are you looking for input tonight from this board? If you have input, we'd love to hear it. Uh, I'll I'll move to those slides, uh, to that slide, and and I have each of the um, images that was small on that slide, um, available in the backup slides as a 
separate. So I'll just flip through these. Um, we studied quite a few colors and color schemes. Um, we looked at many, many precedents. Uh, we gradually came to the conclusion that uh, with the sky as the background uh, and with something this tall, that a dark color um, would feel, starts to feel kind of oppressive. You can see that um, here. And uh, <clears throat> we also tried to take into account the consideration of the other elements that you mentioned. And um, that led us to the conclusion that, you know, we're looking at something in this same, um, uh, I'll say the lightness of the stainless steel and uh, the uh, concrete colors, how, how bright they are. Um, whether we're in the, the grays or the warm or the cold grays or the, yeah, you know, which tone we get into, we're very interested in your input and thoughts. Great. I will, um, I'll, I'll share a couple of thoughts in my comments, then that would be, that'd be great. That was, that was my only question. Yeah, and, I, yeah, and I, I'm going to tack on to that. Thanks, Michael. Um, Stephen, if you could, could you just run through your A through E and kind of give them a, I don't know, a, a, a name, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Yeah, um, you know, th I think that'll be helpful. Other than A, B, C, D, E, um, I, I know for me, you know, I I, I recently picked a, a a color match to try to match a brush aluminum, right? So um, I, I think you know, at least knowing kind of like in, in a broad sense what what kind of color this this is, and might might also help the public too to kind of understand where we are with with A three and then. I think also, you know, looking at your option one that you put up there, um, I mean, it's, it's certainly a, a huge, hugely stark contrast between something like that, um, which is kind of, you know, a, a color that you'd see on, on, you know, perhaps a railroad trestle bridge or something like that, something, you know, a lighter color that you may see on like a college drama bridge or, or you know, this bridge, for instance, you know, it, they, they tend to, they're totally different kind of design vernaculars and it's uh, interesting. So anyway, uh, I'll turn it back over. Uh, so all of these colors that we used here in these simulations are, they all have names which we chose to dispense with because they're all these weird fancy names that some color naming person came up with uh, at uh, the Tanemic uh, Paint Company. Um, but I'll just say that this is uh, kind of a gray. Oops. This has got a yellowish tint, letter B. This has got a teal, uh, a little bit similar to the color that was selected finally for the Berkeley bike bridge. Um, here's a greenish, uh, less, more greenish um, rather than bluish. And uh, here, I believe this was a white, just a straight white. And then uh, because there's so much brick around the campus, we, we looked at this brick color and for the reasons I previously mentioned, um, uh, rejected it. I should also note that in the environmental documents, uh, we already stated that the grid, that the pylon would be a light color. Uh, so we don't really want to go back through that uh, approval process. Excellent. And uh, so my final question here too is so, the the color element that from a paint perspective is really the pylon and then also the I guess there's a where the the cables tie in to the bridge correct those, yeah. those would be the same color yeah. yeah so if we take as a given that the steel deck is going to be painted to match the concrete then that kind of removes it from the equation however the outriggers which um are pictured here let me change colors here. Um, the outriggers which are here could be the same as the steel deck or they could be painted to match the pylon. And we found in our studies that if they, in some cases, if they're painted to match the pylon, it gives some sense of uh, relationship 
and helps tie things together. So that's kind of a, a, a variable. Cool, thank you. And then uh, the only other <coughs> excuse me, question that I had was, um, can you speak a little bit to, uh, I think you said polymer concrete um, for, the, for, the, for the bikeway travel lanes? Uh, did I get that right? Yes. Did I hear you right? Yes. Uh, could you speak a little bit about um, the uniqueness of that material and why it's selected for in, in this instance? So that's a polyester uh, concrete. It's commonly used on automobile uh, bridge decks. It's uh, something that, again, we we chose here because we are so constrained uh, with the depth of the structure that we needed to choose a material that could be uh, as little as three quarters of an inch thick. Um, but we also wanted to choose a material that would wear uh, like concrete and be maintenance free. And so it was the material of choice. Now the companies that provide this material uh, have worked hard to develop versions, uh, tintings that look like concrete or uh, asphalt, uh, but we can uh, tint it with a custom color as well. It's uh, more like a, think of like a fiberglass material, a resin material with an aggregate in it. Excellent. Yeah, it, I, I, I thought, you know, that's a really unique material and a unique, this is obviously a, a, a unique in, uh, usage of it. And I think understanding why I was picked and, 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 and how it ties everything together specifically with the limitations that you mentioned is I think critically important to understand kind of why why the design evolved the way it did in many ways. Uh, so maybe that's just the architect in me <laughs> being a geek about materials. <laughs> I should also mention that it's very flexible. Uh, so uh, we've got a lot with, with movement, it, it shouldn't crack. Excellent, <clears throat> cool. So thank you for that. Um, I don't have any other questions of staff or the applicant, uh, anybody else? Final, last call? All right, um, and then I, I wanted to see if we had, uh, if uh, our member of the public got his Zoom platform updated, maybe he'd like to make a public comment at this time if possible. And if not, that's okay too, but uh, we would like to hear from you if, if possible. Uh, so I'm just gonna wait and see here. As a reminder, um, if you are a member of the public, um, John Sutter, I believe, um, if you're calling in, you can press uh, uh, press star nine to raise your hand, um, and then I'll send you a prompt. All right, so I'm not seeing that hand get raised, so maybe we answered his public comment. Um, again, if, if you want to send me an email, my city email, to make a public comment, I'm, I'm more than happy to read that as well. Uh, so we'll just let this sit for a second here, see if maybe an email pops up or uh, the Zoom platform works one way or the other. Okay, so uh, not seeing email, not seeing a hand raised. So with that, I'd like to move on to comments from the board um, about the project. So Adam, uh, if you would lead us off with comments on the project. Sounds great. Uh, thank you, Chair Weigel. And uh, thank you, staff and applicant team for answering the questions. Uh, thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> yeah, comments on the on the design and the iteration that you've brought. Um, uh, this it's is great to see this this coming back to us again. Um, it's great to see this moving forward. Um, this is uh, yeah, I, I, I continue to think that the design that you're you're zeroing in on is is beautifully done. It's elegant. Um, it's it's you know um, the some of the options that we saw to begin with um, 
uh, you know, this, you know, really rose, rose to the top for, for me in particular and for the, for the board, it seemed like. And, um, uh, I, uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it, you know, in, in terms of, of both, you know, a literal and, and figurative, um, you know, needle and thread that's, that's knitting, uh, the East and the West side as, um, you know, the member of the public who was saying he was on the West side this afternoon and getting back to the East side, this is, and it's difficult to, to, to traverse, um, the highway. And this is, um, providing a very beautiful, uh, um, uh, connection and it's a, it's going to be a great asset continues to be, and I'm really excited to see this moving forward. Um, uh, um, a few comments in, in particular about um, the, the nitty gritty. Um, I do want to um, uh, encourage uh, the, the exploration of, of looking at the art um, uh, being incorporated into the landings. I think that there are a number of, of uh, benefits that that could actually add to the project. It could be an asset. Um, I understand the, the, um, the sequencing of, of the project and trying to keep everything going and and um, yeah, I definitely know that uh, it's it's juggling an, a, an amazing amount of balls to <laughs> keep keep something like this moving. Um, but uh, I, f I feel like that having you know the the artwork is is being one. It's it's a it's a potential for expression of creativity of the community. Um, it is a way to engage the community um, both on both sides um, of the of this. Uh, of, of the project, you've got the the JC, you've got the neighborhoods on the um, west side, you've got Smart Train over there. There are, are ways to to use that um, in a very visible way to to um, announce those um, entrances and exits to the to the structure um, that could address some of the um, the wayfinding um, for this. That it doesn't just look like um, you know a seat wall that, that's there, and then you see often. You see the the rising up to the bridge in the distance. This is a way to create um, two destination points, two nodes um, for the pathways. Um, it's that idea of you know hub and spoke node and pathway. That this you're creating um, uh, the the landing as it is now. Um, I, I appreciate the simplicity of the design. Um, I think you know the nice swooping um, seat walls. The lighting is great, um, uh, um, but I I feel that it's. Um, the where where the simplicity and elegance of the the bridge and the structure the decking the pylon um the stainless steel the the netting and the and the cables um are all great the the where this bridge um touches down to the ground i feel like it it is um it could deal with with some more um kind of oomph to it the, it's the bridge itself is elegant the the simplicity of the landings at this point feel a little bare bones um and uh, and and so I could, um, with incorporating art, you know, there could be some um, sculptural elements um, instead of the the island at the uh, the eastern edge on Elliot um, instead of trees or three of a grouping of three trees. I understand this is all conceptual, but there could be a sculptural piece there. Um, uh, and the west side of Edwards, there could be you know something behind the seat walls that is another type of um, sculptural element. Um, Again, it, it provides the artwork and the creativity, but when getting to the safety and the um, announcing of the of this bridge um, on the ground, um, they could provide. You know, uh, you've got um, bikers coming down from the bridge um, with these low seat walls, um, low-ish seat walls, having something behind it, visibility to to um, to to know that they're that basically to, to have that path of travel be the turn um to have some some visibility break could be sculptural element in at night especially um your the lighting on the seat walls is going to is is re, is going to be really great but having something more um in the back there could be sculptural with a lighted component something like that and so there's just another uh, I'm riffing off of the idea of exploring that while you're doing this um this design iteration um <laughs> Uh, to that end, um, uh, moving into the um, the landscape and um, the the uh, the plant palette that you've chosen um, is is uh, is appropriate and and um, really um, creative and great. It's a it's a, a nice palette that you've got here. Um, it is also um, 
necessarily low um, growing. I feel like there could be some diversity of height um, in terms of the, the plant species that you've chosen. Um, I don't see any, uh, um, I believe, any um, larger shrubs um, in here. You've got um, one tree species, but um, uh, thinking of, of, you've got a lot of forbs, the you know, non-woody flowering materials, um, but looking at um, um, shrubby, shrubby uh, 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 plant species as well. Um, you could keep going with the the, the native plant palette, native-ish plant palette that you've got too, with something like a manzanita or a coffee berry, something hardy that um, will grow, be beautiful, but provides some uh, of visual uh, um, layering as well. And so separation from the, the traffic around, and then also announces where people should go for wayfinding. Um, uh, do, 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 um, uh, one nitpicky thing with the um, plant species. Again, I know it's conceptual, but the orange milkweed, um, definitely beautiful, but um, I, I'd encourage um, whichever landscape architect um, designer you have on, on, on the team to look into some of the thoughts about having um, the uh, um, exotic milkweeds rather than native um, adapted milkweeds. There um, are concerns, you know, milkweed is great to have for um, the um, monarchs and butterflies, but there's concerns with having tropical milkweed that, um, to get really deep into it, but there, there's some concerns with that. And so there's, I would encourage looking at the, um, the native uh, adapted species. There's showy milkweed, which is very beautiful and, lo and lovely and has big flowers. Um, and is also great um, uh, forage material and host material for the butterfly species. There's a narrow leaf milkweed, which is even more applicable to the native habitats. One thing to think about there. With the um, tree species, I encourage, rather than just the one that you've called out with the golden rain, to look at some diversity of tree species, um, both ecologically, but also visually as well. Um, uh, doo -doo. Let's see here. Um, yeah, the um, I did want um, uh, to reemphasize the, the public comments about the integration to the bike network. Again, we are uh, this is a thread that's that's coming across the highway. Um, uh, we we need to know where this is. This, this is not just living on its own. It's it's connected to the the networks. Uh, I know that's a larger conversation. Um, I also know that it's. Um, it's complicated with the the funding that's uh, that's available for this and has been um, sounds like been reallocated to Hearn. Um, I do um, I know that that is a much larger conversation. Um, one of the things that of that's an advocate for this pro project is the Hearn overpass is vehicular and um, bike. This is um, strictly bike and pedestrian. Um, if we're talking about priorities um, for. Uh, the, you know, uh, for our city initiatives, this um, with having having this be a a key priority to uh, to knit with bike and pedestrian in particular, no vehicular traffic on this bridge is a very important priority. Um, uh, so um, I would like to see that emphasized as well. Um, uh, that being said, also I think it's a, a an interesting thing to think about of the. Um, interpretive opportunities, the programmatic opportunities across the um, structure, uh, the integrating something into the paving is good. Um, there could be also um, panels, um, very small and interpretive panels of some sort w along the bridge, something to um, that could be creative. Again, thinking about um, outreaching to um, to different communities around this the project too. Um, <clears throat> The color of the pylon, um, since you wanted um, distinct um, feedback from us about that, um, uh, thank you for exploring all the the different um, options, and thanks for thanks for showing those uh, to us. Um, for me, I I, um, I I I feel that the lightness, the airiness of the the bridge will be enhanced um, uh, and complemented by going with the lighter. Um, uh, paint choices that you've got here. Uh, thinking about the, um, uh, the beauty of of the, it's soaring up into the sky with the clouds of something that matches um, 
bright white clouds, um, this, the, you know, the stark bright colors going with that. Um, I think that this, um, yeah, it, it could, we don't want to necessarily have this blend, um, into into the surroundings, but actually be this um, uh, very uh, um, you know narrow spire that is um, elegant and beautiful. Um, there are reason why a lot of, as Drew mentioned, Calatrava, that going with the white soaring architecture there, very beautiful, um, very um, light and airy, while they're also strong and um, substantive at the same time. So that would be that's my two cents on on the color. Um, and I believe that will do it for me. And thanks um, everyone for for um, advocating for this bridge and all of your efforts. Um, I know that people have been involved with this for many years and really um, glad that this is moving forward. Thank you. Um, this is going to be a wonderful asset um, to the entire city. Thanks, Adam. Um, it looks like we might have a hand raised of like Mara Baldwin, and she's part of the applicant team. Perhaps that's maybe related to planting. So, uh, recording secretary, maybe uh, can you grant her permission to speak? That'd be great. Hi, can you hear me? This is Maura Baldwin. I'm the landscape architect on the bridge team. And um, I was struggling to try to connect while you were asking your questions um, about the planting. So I don't think I captured all of them. But um, just to address the two that I did take note of, the non-native butterfly weed, um, I did look at the others. And I selected that one because I wanted to add some sort of pops of color in, within this kind of um, native -y meadow, which is uh, meant to evoke the underlying native environment of the Valley Oak grasslands. But, you know, that it, it, just because it's a, you know, contemporary structure and very public, it just, I felt it needed some sort of additional little input from and um, the, so the kangaroo paw and the um, this Asclepius both are happen to be orange, which is conceptual, but I, I like it. <laughs> and it yeah. pops pops in this kind of vast field of uh, low grasses and um, lots of uh, um, yarrow. And um, the other comment I think was on the Colrutaria, that tree species, which happens to be, I had a, a tough time kind of selecting a couple of species from the street, the city street tree list. So that's usually kind of a you know, requirement. So that was one that I picked from that list. I'm happy to change it, um, but that, <laughs> that was the reason for that. It's a beautiful tree, but I was oh, yeah. kind of heading towards the kind of the night native um, scheme. Well, did yeah, I miss others? You. Do you want to? Uh... No, no, I, th I think that, oh, um, just in terms of uh, shrubs and, and oh, variation right. in, yes. in height. So, yeah. Yes. Um, we did talk about that a fair amount. I, it's kind of, I kind of kept pushing for the issue of, of flammability, especially given, um, um, you know, sort of, we're, we live in a fires climate and Santa Rosa is certainly familiar with that. Um, and uh, so my experience and um, people, landscape architects who are kind of like, focusing on uh, firescaping are thinking more and more about shrubbery, which um, builds up sort of a dense twiggy interior. And especially when it, it just, you know, maintenance crews cannot help but shear shrubs and they shear them. So there's a sure. little green perimeter covering up a dense twiggy interior, which is, which ignites instantly. So that's my reason for moving away from shrubs. I totally agree with everything you said about, you know, having more massing and um, which is a nice thing, but, um, and this, uh, these are very long, narrow planting areas. So once you start putting in bigger yeah. shrubs, um, you sort of lose that, but those are my reasons behind it. Yeah. Oh, sure. No, definitely. And thank you. Yeah. It's, uh, um, I am definitely pleased with the, with the design. There's definitely not a, um, uh, throwing the baby out with the bathwater, um, but um, yeah, the um, you know there there 
Definitely, you know, fire is a concern uh, prim primarily around, you know, um, residential structures and thinking about flammability of this um, area. Um, yeah, it's 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 a concern and the shearing, of course, um, land landscapers, um, you know, it's it's almost a one size fits all thing in terms of maintenance. Um, but uh, yeah, there there are, you know, there are species, you know, I um, I trust your, your judgment on this. Um, but, uh, you know, just think, thinking about ways to provide some of that visual layering and, and relief um, would be great. Sure. Um, and if you look mm -hmm. more closely at the, um, the sort of uh, the east side, the, the, north, um, the northwest corner of the east side where um, Bent 8 is, the big mm -hmm. structure, um, I've worked on that a lot and developed mm -hmm. a kind of um, – uh, a scheme of uh, arcs that mimic the cables of the bridge and also the Very long cool. arcing bench. And so I felt like that kind of was a substitute for the sort of layering effect So big sweeping arcs of succulents alternating with grasses. And um, yeah, so you could kind of look into my plan in that yeah. place to see what, what's happening there. Definitely. Yeah, and and thank you for you know when when we provide feedback, you know, it, it, it is conversational and hearing the design intent is, um, yeah. you know, that's a that's ninety percent of what what you know I as a designer want to hear some you know it, I, I want to tell someone what to do. I basically want to hear the rationale why it was chosen, and right. um, that's yeah. always helpful. Yeah. Well, um, thank you for your comments. I appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, and um, pops of color in terms of um, other natives too. I know I'm, I'm sure you've looked at them and you've gone with the orange palette. You know, the, the California fuchsia is one that's also that's a beautiful bright colors too, um, and it does have variations. And there's some height differences in, in a lot of different species. Something there. Um, um, so yeah, there there are plenty of options. I know it's a work in progress, but I want to bring that up. And my question uh, or my uh, thought about the trees was was. Um, was to think about um, upping the diversity of the trees, you know, rather than having just one. Well, from what I see, I only see one tree species called out. Um, to think of, um, you know, uh, other 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 options too as well. Um, but yeah, that uh, that um, the city tree um, tree list is a, a good place to start. As is uh, the immediate neighborhood too on both sides. So. Right, exactly. And then just to mention that on on the east side, we are losing five big old native oaks and yeah, so uh, i was really yeah. i i was really motivated to kind of attempt to replace that that habitat and um there's the, the valley oaks i think there's a coast live oak in there too but just to try to start to replace that because that's yeah. the, the underlying native habitat so that yeah well thank of, you and, and the, the yeah, amount of space that. is limited and so uh yeah, yeah i thought i would focus on that. Yeah, yeah, and you know, as the the other the the landscape architect on the the board, um, I seeing that in the first iterations and the first proposal, I remember those those trees that were being yeah. um, removed, and it's a bitter pill to swallow. But with development, sometimes that's what has to happen. And so, thank you for incorporating that um, into your um, uh, design now. So, thank you. Sure. Yeah, and that should do it for me, Chair. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Appreciate that. Um, so, and, and I'm glad we were able to get the uh, landscape uh, architect uh, involved in a couple of comments there. So that's great. Kind of a vestige of uh, uh, room seven there, if anybody remembers. <laughs> we had kind of a back and forth uh, over a conference table before we moved to the to the council chambers and now virtually. So it was it was uh, always a it was a design charrette at that time, right? It was, yeah, yeah. Room seven was uh, always a good time. I thought. Uh, it, it, it was a little bit more personal, uh, but it, it, this is a great format too. All right, uh, comments. Uh, I'm going to go to board member Stapp. Uh, I mainly want to echo the enthusiasm for this project that's been expressed by a lot of folks online and, and members of the public. Um, I too can't wait to, to walk across this bridge. Um, we need more elegant transitions between the east and west side in Santa Rosa, um, most notably downtown. I wish it was easier downtown to make the transition. Um, and perhaps this um, this, and ultimately a herm would be good examples. Um, I love the simplicity. Um, to, to, board, to board member Sharon's point about the light color on the pylon, I completely agree. Let's keep it light and simple. 
Um, also to board member Sharon's point about the landing areas, um, they, I like the idea of making them genuine, genuinely outdoor rooms. Um, I'm not sure how to do that, but I agree that the, the, the current versions seem perhaps, perhaps too simplistic. Um, what would make people, you know, what, what would draw people to those areas or make them sit down or slow down if they're on bikes to sit there? Um, art's probably an integral piece of that. Um, and I do like the idea of finding a way to integrate art in those landing areas as opposed to just just in the in the planted areas, which are probably likely to get lost in the shadows and under, under the bridge. Hopefully not. Uh, um, but, but again, focusing on those landing areas. Um, this is my first time seeing this project, so it was interesting for me to see that to see the notes and hear about the uh, how this project has evolved. Um, I do like the transitions on the fe on the fencing um, and how the and how the planted areas were, were handled, particularly with the addition of the rocks um, a, as a way of making sure that those planted areas um, um, stay stay pleasant um, and are less conducive to to encampments. Just confirming my notes here. And I think that's, I think those are, are my main thoughts. Again, just, just um, appreciation for how this design has evolved and, and, and I'm very much looking forward to seeing it built. So thank you, thank you very much. Thanks, Mark. Uh, board Member McHugh. Well, Comments? thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm very excited about the project as well and very excited. I, would, I can't wait to see it built. Uh, I uh, love the design. Uh, I like the bright colors. I mean, if I had to make a choice, I like the I, I like the the teal uh, uh, color for the for the uh, uh, I guess the pylon, if that's a correct term for that. Uh, very much uh, uh, like the redesign of uh, the east side of the uh, uh, of the uh, of the bridge. Um, one thing, though, I'm a little bit concerned about, and we've talked a little bit about encampments, but the way those cement uh, 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 benches are uh, would uh, some way, in, in some ways, I think some of our, some of our uh, homeless uh, uh, citizens will probably take, take advantage of the fact that they are there and that uh, I'd like my the somebody to think about ways to maybe break those up a little bit so that that doesn't occur. Um, so that would be my only my only basic criticism. Uh, I support uh, uh, the comments by both the applicant and uh, uh, member Sharon in terms of the of the plantings and the trees and that sort of thing. And so, I'm just very excited about the project and very much want the project to move forward and be to be built as soon as it possibly can. I want to walk across it as well. So thank you. Those are my comments. Thanks, John. Um, actually, I'm going to maybe turn this into a question of the applicant um, in terms of your concerns on the benches. I mean, obviously, we're not seeing also like skateboard deterrence and things like that at this stage. Um, so maybe, uh, Stephen, could you address maybe your general thoughts about how you guys, uh, you know, typically in a situation like this would deal with, you know, uh, you know, those, the, you know, uh, John's and I think Mark's concerns about encampment, utilizing the benches as sleeping areas, those types of things, also skateboarding, you know, deterrence and whatnot, because this is a pretty inviting skateboard rail <coughs> to some people. So. So we're going to try to address the skateboard uh, deterrence uh, question with the reveals that you may not be able to make out in this rendering. <clears throat> so every seven feet at the same rhythm as the uh, guard stanchions, uh, you see a, uh, a reveal <clears throat> in the concrete. I understand that that is not sufficient to deter this as a, as a little bed. Uh, use as a as a bed. Uh, so we're going to take that uh, board members McHugh's uh, thoughts about that um, and think about it more. Yeah, could you could you bring up page twenty eight in your presentation? I, I think uh, this might, at least in terms of the uh, 
skateboarding deterrent component that I brought up, which, which is similar to what John brought up, but uh, I'm seeing it now in terms of the reveal, but I, I thought maybe the rest of the board might want to take a peek at that. Uh, if, you could, uh, if you could bring up page 28 of your uh, presentation. This is slide 28. I'm not sure um, which one. Yeah, the numbered slide 28 of 47. Yeah, I think this in the lower right, this says 28. So if I've got the wrong one, tell me where to go. I'm actually not seeing anything up right now. Oh, well, gosh, that would do it. That's it. Perfect. So, yeah, so um, this is what, what Stephen was talking about, oh, that, that rhythm of the, the breaks in the concrete. That's what would prevent skateboard rail grinding, if you will. Uh, and uh, that, that rhythm is repeated elsewhere. I, I think as I was re-looking at it, it's a, it's a little harder to see on uh, some of these uh, on my iPad, but it's, uh, yeah, it's, you can see it there now. Everybody's clear on that. Excellent. Thanks, Stephen. So with that, John, anything else? No, no. Thank you. Okay. Awesome. Uh, so I'm going to go to Vice Chair Birch for his comments on the project. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> you know, reiterate what several uh, board members have already shared, which is that the community comments, questions, enthusiasm um, are, are just everybody. This is a project that it feels like the community is focusing on together, the community who's come out to talk about it. Um, <clears throat> there's, there's openness and there's interest from lots of different parties. And I think that uh, that really bodes well for the project, that this is not a controversial project, that this is not, uh, that this is something that there's such an appetite for. Um, <clears throat> I know I will be commuting from the west or the east side of town where I live in the JC neighborhood to my office on the west side of town using this bridge. I've, I have not become a bicycle commuter to work primarily because of my fear of college in Steel Lane and um, being able to alleviate that piece and make it through um, what hopefully becomes the Jennings um, uh, uh, Smart Crossing. Um, if, if we ever get to the Jennings Smart Crossing, which is just critical to the west side of town and circulation there, um, I would be at my office with very little contact with traffic on high, high volume roads. So. Um, anyway, I'm as enthusiastic as everyone else that this is going to get done, and I appreciate all the work that's gone into it since 2007. That's an incredible length of time. And for those members of the public who are on the call still, who are part of that group, um, all I can say is thank, thank you from me and thank you from the entire community because your persistence um, is going to create one of the most important um, forward-looking uh, statements that Santa Rosa could could even begin to think about. So, what I really love about where the this has gone and the selection of this of this piece um, of this type of a structure, um, and the and and the and the very simple contemporary character of this structure, the lightness of this structure, not a billboard, not a promotional ad for Santa Rosa. We don't need any more peanuts characters. We don't need any more grapevines. This is a proud civic structure. It is lithe and elegant, and it will it is it is the artwork. It is the piece that will define traveling through Santa Rosa. And um, if if postcards were still postcards, it would be on the postcard. Hopefully, it'll be all over the web, which is a whole other universe now. But this is the symbol of a new era of transportation. I think that. The difference in the appearance, and I'm going to go back to uh, comments from uh, regarding the Hernover crossing. The Hernover crossing is bulky concrete girder construction. It's still, it's still, it, it by necessity, it is still about car traffic. I, I realize that the uh, pedestrian and bike piece has been worked into it, but you look at that, and it is a grumpy, low-shouldered old bridge for cars. And this is in its likeness, in its simplicity, in its transparency, 
seeing bikes, seeing pedestrians, and understanding that this is a, a thread. I, I love this term about a thread between the East and the West. Um, I think people will understand that this is new, this is exciting, and this is about moving into an era of a, a completely different way of moving people around. And it is going to be very exciting to see it just, just because of its form. I think the form speaks to the function and I think that it will be, um, it will educate people about what uh, traveling without uh, without vehicles, without motor vehicles uh, is all about. So um, I'm really happy we've made it to this point. I think that Adam's comments on, on landscape, as I am always appreciative of his eye for detail and his technical knowledge there um, are great. Uh, I do like the idea of artworks at the terminus at each at each end um contemporary bold exciting real artworks um not uh, not chamber of commerce um art please it would be much much better as uh, something that really was in keeping with um the message about transportation uh with the form of the bridge with the contemporary character of the bridge if, if it went that direction and i know there's complexity to that i really do understand it but i'm going to shared as well. So as far as the color of the pylon goes, um, I really lean toward uh, white. Um, this probably speaks directly to the problem that Drew was having, trying to find a color to match brushed aluminum, because the minute that you're not using a brushed metal, you, you have gray <laughs> and you have different grumpier forms of gray. Um, you can, you can work on adding a, a metallic, having a metallic paint that brings some, uh, creates a surface texture, a surface profile, if you will, um, that can help in that. So my my comment is I'm very much a fan of white. Um, I think that white is going to, white's not going to fade. White is not going to, um, if you get into light grays, if you start to get into warmer uh, uh, whites, you can you can be you can be yellow very quickly. You can be sort of a vanilla color very quickly. You can be battleship gray sort of accidentally, um, or you can just just be too cool. And I do think this needs to stand out. And really, uh, the the comment that I think Mark made, or uh, I think about this reaching to the clouds and being part of the cloud and and sort of the, having the sky capture the white and and reflect it back is great. If there's any, I don't know the paint system you would be using, and I know this is quite a, 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 a unique comment, but if there was some way to get into some iridescence or a white that had um, a, 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 a fine metallic character to it, not a not a big flake metallic like a show car, but if there was some way to get into a material that had some iridescence or some depth of finish just a bit in, in the painted finish, that would be especially wonderful. But uh, but I would definitely, definitely say that your slide E or your option E of white would be would be my preference overall. And I think the lighting would really just the, the, the lighting in the evening would really, really stand out with a white uh, with a white pylon. So. Yep. And those are my um, go get it done. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get it built. Yeah, I was I was actually going to ask Stephen to go to these slides. Um, I'm just going to tack on to your comment here. Uh, I think I thought I heard Stephen say uh, kinemic, kinemic. Um, I think they have a, a fluorinar, fluorinar metallic, uh, which is a fluoropolymer uh, 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 coating. Um, I'm, I'm assuming you guys are going to go with a hynar kynar fluoropolymer coating. Uh, they're super durable. If they get damaged, they can be repaired. Um, could you maybe speak to that, Stephen? Yes, that's exactly correct. And in fact, there are metallic options. Um, I used a metallic tenemic on a project 20 years ago, and it, it still looks like it did when it was first painted. So it holds up quite well if you choose the right color. I, uh, at around that same time frame, I used a, a warm reddish color on another project, and it's faded terribly with the same paint system. Um, so um, the very perspicacious and knowledgeable comments are really appreciated here. Thank you, all of you. 
Thank you. Um, so yeah, so I, I, I have a, just a couple of comments. Um, I, I pretty much agree with everybody else <laughs> that we've heard. Um, I would definitely agree with Michael on kind of a, a, a added metallic to the white. I'm, I'm a fan of this white as well. I think when we originally saw it and it was white, I, I think my initial reaction was, yep, that, that right there. Uh, that's, that's the ticket. And so, uh, it's, while it's nice to see all the iterations, uh, and what could be, I think I'm still really drawn to this, uh, option E the most. I think it's got the, it's got the most flexibility for future construction for what may be built around it. It's not trying to, to, to weave into anything else because this is its own thing. It's its own piece of public art. And I think we've, we've mentioned this before. Um, when we, we reviewed this project, um, I was actually, I went back and I was reading the, the meeting minutes from the November meeting of last year. And, uh, it was kind of funny. I, I, I knew exactly which ones were Warren's <laughs> because they were talking about this element as, as its own really unique special piece of art. And, um, I think that's, that's the exceptionally interesting draw of something like this. Um, you know, when, when people mention, you know, Minneapolis, for instance, uh, you immediately think of there's an art museum designed by Santiago Calatrava. It's white. It moves. It's light and airy, right? Uh, it's one of those architectural pieces that um, it, it helps provide identity to a place. Um, and I think, you know, this is, is it, it's, it's not a, an art museum by any stretch of the imagination, but it is a very unique and special piece of art and architecture together um, that is going to be unique to our city. And uh, I think, like Michael said, if postcards were a thing, right, uh, this would be the postcard. Uh, so maybe this is going to be the Instagram uh, thing or, or the Twitter, whatever whatever the new thing is in 10 years, right? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think, and I really like the idea of the white against the backdrop of the uh, outriggers as well. I think that uh, provides a nice juxtaposition between the, the different materiality that's happening with the cables and everything coming down. I think, I think it wouldn't be as effective as if the uh, the outriggers were a gray to match the concrete. Um, so I think that balance of white against concrete, against sky, against stainless steel, it's all going to work really, really well together. And I think adding that metallic component, I think does add the stainless steel back into the painted components as well. And, um, you know, but I think it's just ever so slight. It's not, not a overwhelming metallic. I think it's just something that's integrated in a thoughtful way. Um, um, I think we, you know, I think the city needs to pursue, uh, the art components more, uh, in terms of how they're integrated into the landings. I'm still a very, I'm still very firmly, I'm still a firm believer that we should not put art on the bridge itself in terms of, uh, I guess, like in pathways, vertical pieces of art, I guess is what I should say. I did really love the idea from the members of the public about potentially painting, uh, you know, the, the bike paths and stuff. I mean, that that's a really interesting idea. Um, and that's something that maybe could, you know, the art and public places committee could look at. Uh, I don't know, a design competition for elementary age kids to participate in or, or something like that. I mean, I, th I think it's a really interesting and unique way to engage the, the pedestrian bike travel areas with uh, public art that could change over time. I mean, I think in, in a way what has happened downtown on 4th Street during the pandemic in terms of all the interesting artwork that occurred on 4th Street downtown um, you know, something like that could translate to the bridge in many ways, uh, and it could be tied to our public schools, the, J the JC, um, things that are unique to Sonoma County, agriculture, um, of course, peanuts, if we wanted to integrate that as well. Um, but all of the great things that are happening here, uh, uh, you know, that make this such a great place to live, that could be something that could be incorporated into the, the walking pathway to make it less uh, just a walking pathway or less a bike path because I think this is going to see a lot of use um, over time, especially with the JC being right there, this new housing project that's probably 50% done right now. Um, I mean, all the, all the folks that attend the JC that live here, they're going to walk across and go to Target and 
uh, cutting town and they're going to shop and then they're going to come back. I mean, this is very much going to be used, uh, you know, uh, over its life. So I appreciate that. Um, I guess the, my my only kind of criticism would be uh, the I guess the West Landing, the Dick Landing. I, I was never really in love with it uh, the last time we saw this, and, and I like it a little bit more now with the sculpted bench and the acid etched concrete. I just feel like the the rectilinear nature of that landing is is not as interesting as uh, what's being proposed on the east side. And I know there are some constraints with kind of property lines and other things. Um, and kind of, you know, coming down off the bridge from a bike speed perspective. But, um, you know, I, I, I don't know the answer here. <laughs> um, but this just, you know, the, the east side is so much more playful and integrated into pathways and the landscape. And I know we're a little constrained here, but I'm, I'm, I'm just curious what sort of, uh, you know, maybe there's just an additional curve or flare or something that kind of helps it be a little less square because the other side is, is so sculptural and ha and it does very much relate to the sculptural nature and quality of the, the bridge pylon and, and things like that. So that would be my only kind of negative criticism. Um, but again, if we're constrained and this is kind of is what it is, <laughs> but I, you know, sometimes uh, you have to make a, a consideration uh, when, when you're stuck uh, because of lot lines or whatever else. And, and I understand that. But that'd be my only kind of, Let's let's eke out the last little bit of design language uh, on this landing. Um, so with that, I think I don't have any other comments. I, I appreciate the the change in the the guardrails um, and and bringing it down and being less abrupt uh, and kind of the more just more detail and information about uh, everything. Can you hear me? Yeah. Everybody died. I apologize. Um, so with that, uh, oh, they're still talking. Hang on. Uh, okay. Sorry about that. Um, yeah. So that would be my last comment. I, I just, I, I really, I think this is a really great project now. Um, let's find the money and build it. Uh, does anybody have any additional comments? I'll make one clarification to the paint comment. Metallic is, and, I, and I'm sure that um, I'm sure that Stephen understands. Uh, metallic it, it, it can be thought of as being bold and flaky. I'm, I'm I'm thinking of a very fine metallic that creates a little depth to the surface and a little bit of um, shimmer more than uh, more than a, a, a sparkle. So, and I think I conveyed that, and I'm sure that that's. A direction that if it's possible um that could go so totally understand uh, thank you drew i i wanted to clarify one thing um just yeah, in, in my my in my um my comment about um any you know interpretive opportunities along the, the bridge itself and i just mentioned panels it was uh just wanted to be certain that everyone else today was thinking very anything very small you know hand size something like that not panels on the bit on the, the bridge itself um and take that or leave it but just interpretive opportunities as well for that pedestrian scale not for people off the bridge um driving by say yeah i would agree i think uh uh, vehicular scale versus pedestrian scale is a really critical element of this project. And I think the design team has done an exceptional job of really um, respecting pedestrian scale in a, in a very impactful way while also making an impactful piece of architecture. Um, and I think that's, that's one of the things that I really like about this project is that it's, it is balancing those two things really well. Um, and, and I think <clears throat> from a safety perspective, I'm particularly concerned about putting anything on the bridge that's have to read or look at um, just because I, th I think, like I said, when I was going back and looking at the previous comments, a lot of the comments really appreciated the, the transparency of the, the mesh. And 
everything else and that you, you know, I think the mesh will somewhat disappear and you'll really just see the pylon. And I think that um, that's less distractive to someone, less distracting to someone who's driving as opposed to like, you got to read something about the history of Santa Rosa or you have to read something about whatever, um, or, you know, have your kids in the back seat start screaming at you and they're like, well, what's this? And you have to find a way to answer them. And, um, while also driving on 101, <laughs> which I think, you know, uh, presents presents itself with some some problems. So I, th I think the scale uh, is particularly important, both in any art that goes on, on, on any of the wire mesh or anything like that. So thanks, Adam. Anybody else? Okay, so with that, um, Typically, we wrap up with the applicant team if they've got any questions of us, if anything that we've made comments on are infeasible or uh, totally harebrained. Um, so with that, we'll just go back to the applicant team, uh, Stephen and uh, Chris. Uh, any of our comments, are they uh, infeasible to do or, or really not appropriate uh, where you are in, the, in your current age of the document? Chris, you want to speak to that first? <laughs> hey, Stephen, you can go ahead. I, I'll just, I'll just say we are very, very far along, and we are on a very tight uh, schedule in order to meet funding deadlines. Uh, so there isn't a lot of wiggle room. Um, but your comments, I felt, uh, were uh, understanding that, and a lot of. A lot of the comments can be thought of, still thought about, um, like with paint color or little tweaks to the seat walls, um, things like that. Um, as far as the art element, um, that really needs to be handled as a separate process on a separate um, schedule. But we will look a little harder at uh, where there may be an opportunity on the east side to allocate space. Um, I don't think uh, the, the west side is so heavily constrained um, by property lines and safety considerations and ADA um, ramp and, and so forth that, that we don't have a lot of wiggle room there. Um, there's one other thing I would just touch on. Um, on the east side, uh, a lot of the design of the bridge was driven by, in fact, saving some of the major oaks that are there. So I didn't want to give the wrong impression that we're wiping out all those oaks. In fact, we, we put a lot of work into saving uh, we are losing, losing a couple, but um, we're saving the, the major ones. Um, okay, I think I think that's it. Chris, anything else from you? Good. No, I don't have anything. All right. So with that, um, no further comments from the board, <clears throat> and uh, doesn't look at any more raised hands. We will close item eight point one. Thank you all. So thank for you, applicant team. Thank you. We appreciate it. And with that, we will move on to item nine, which is adjournment. So uh, with, with that, uh, Mark, thanks for joining us in your last design review board meeting. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, look forward to seeing you uh, on city council. So uh, with that, it is 703 and we stand adjourned. Have a great weekend, everybody. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, all. Bye-bye.